I adopted Angela. Oh, well, she's my it's, nemesis. It's not legal. Yeah, she married my nemesis. <laughs> Tim, the virologist, came on the cruise and is here to tell us about COVID-19. Keep wearing masks and use hand sanitizer, and we'll be okay if you know what I mean. And please have fun on the cruise. I can't believe that this really is happening. Finally, we all are together at sea. It's been two years and the world is quite different. I won't infect you if you won't infect me. But be aware that with every new variant, vaccine immunity might start to wane. Keep social distancing in the community so we don't have to go through this again. And if you stay careful, my friends, soon the pandemic will end. song and I found out later, I think and I think you one told me to find it on YouTube. I didn't realize it. So I thought that was awfully sweet again. Can you hear me? Oh I can you want volume? I can volume. Stereo. Stereo. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so anyway still can't hear you still can't. Okay. Oh there we go. I just gotta be closer already. And I guess you plug in. Okay. You gotta eat the um, mic. Don't use the mic? No. Eat it. Eat it. it. Oh. Yeah, it was, it's been dipped in something, so. Yeah. No, no, mine has COVID on it. Don't eat it. Uh. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Right, right. Uh, okay. Yeah, there you go. Keep, keep yelling at me when I mess up. Um, so, I set up three, I offered three shadow cruises based on feedback on Facebook. I assumed I'd, I assumed I'd get one. And um, now we have three. So there's one today, one Wednesday, and one Thursday, and slightly different topics. The Wednesday one is about careers in biomedical sciences, and I'm depending and hoping that other people in biomedical aspects of life will show up at that one to share what different careers look like, pluses, minus, and things of that sort, and answer questions. Uh, and then for Thursday's lecture is more of a general discussion of viruses, how they compare and relate to other things. Um, but this one is the one that's touching us the most. Um, oh, and that's my biosafety level three alpha. That's what you got to wear to work on COVID. This guy here has got by far the best one. <laughs> He's still, he has the air circulation pack and everything, and it's quiet. That one, it sounds like a, a, a gale going on in your head. Um, so that's cool. Um, so anyway, I had planned all these really cool slides and stuff. They're all in iCloud, and I can't get it, my internet connection to work on the computer yet. And um, folks downstairs have had trouble. So hopefully by Wednesday or Friday, Thursday, we'll have some more visible slides. Uh, so I have buttons that I can hang out afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's also more. Outside, on the door outside of my room, um, so you can go down there and grab some more. Uh, the way to find it, it's the moment to pick flamingo. On the door. So, I thought I'd talk about a couple things and then let everybody else take over. Um, I encourage other people in, that work in this space to chime in as well or correct me, because as it says on the last second to the last line, I will probably say something incorrect. <laughs> um, but. I interact or have interacted with companies that are working on COVID 
Um, the only one I'm working with, so the, yellow, the highlighted yellow is because the company kept getting bought, bought out and bought out. Bought out. <laughs> um, so Fire Farmer and Shire were the two that I was consulting for. But I do have research funding from Moderna as of March 1. It's not on COVID. It's on another virus called CMV, which is uh, my normal line of research. Uh, so take it for what it's worth. I don't expect there's any conflict. And again, I'm going to give you educated opinion. Hi. I'm, I'm going to give an educated opinion on my if things the best I can answer. They're not necessarily the view of my employer. Right? These are all the disclosures, right? And so don't go after the medical school. I'm at UMass Chan because um, Tim said because I'm probably wrong. Um, and then lastly, I'm not an MD, though I you know, cosplay one on a boat. And um, I'm a PhD researcher, so there's lots of clinicians here as well who can give you a perspective. What I can tell you is it's awful in hospitals. I interact closely with patients and especially the infectious disease doctors, and it's not done yet on the hospital level. Things are going down, but uh, as of two weeks ago, our hospital was, ICU was still full, so you had to wait your turn and hope you live long enough to get in there for treatment um, so it's tough and the doctors and the nurses especially the nurses are just trashed can i ask where your icu is i, I work in gainesville hospital in gainesville florida so i'm kind of curious where you're at uh, umass chan medical school in worcester it's Worcester. it's a chain what's stuff thank you uh, <laughs> so so the chan family um donated a couple hundred million dollars and so they got their name on it uh, which is a godsend for us. Uh, so if you ever looked at or read about Harvard School of Public Health, it's Chan School of Public Health, same family. So they've been very sharing with resources. Anyway, okay, so there's a, car, there's a reconstruction on the left of coronavirus. You've probably all seen that drawing. That's based on cryo-electron microscopy, which Woo! allows you to hey, <laughs> which allows you to build 3D structures by doing thousands and thousands of different angles and different regions of the, uh, the virus particle, and then computationally build them back up into a common structure. Okay. So the things, the red things sticking out are the spike protein. That's what attaches to a cell re receptor. It's called ACE2 and allows it to get into cells. Okay. And the antibodies we use to stop infection, they're called neutralizing antibodies, bind to that red protein and prevent it from binding to cells. And so RNA viruses, which is what this is, mutate at a certain frequency. Uh, but what matters is when the mutations happen in spike. Especially, here's the, let's see if I can get over here. Um, this is a cryo-EM reconstruction of the spike protein. <laughs> wow. um, it's actually three proteins that kind of twist around each other. And these green spots are the regions of the protein that bind to the cell receptor called ACE2. That's where the neutralizing antibodies will bind to prevent that interaction from happening. So it's mutations here that are among the most important for preventing, you know, allowing a virus to have a breakthrough. Same with the vaccines. It's mo so the, the, mo the latest variant has 80 mutations in that area. Um, these other parts sometimes help hide from the immune system. And, and so you have this working and you have some of these other parts as well that are accumulating mutations that allow even vaccinated people to get infected. Okay. Um, so there's, these are the strains. Wuhan's the original virus. And then it was alpha, it's Greek letters, alpha, beta, beta, omicron, they skip the letter. Um, there's two versions, there's BA1, that's what it's going around everywhere in the world. And there's a new variant called BA2, which has a bunch of mutations here. And it's spreading faster than this one did. It doesn't look like it's making anybody sicker. Um, and um, several of the companies are developing boosters based on this especially the RNA vaccines, because you can do that quickly. Uh, I think they're in trials now, or they're about to go in trials. Um, 
So this is, you know, an ongoing process which may not ever end. Then you left out Delta. I did leave out Delta. <laughs> oh man, I second, thought. Second baddest one. Yeah. Oh, see, I told you I'd lie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You already covered yourself. So what's next? The real answer is who knows, right? Um, probably some combination of these things are our reality going forward. Uh, are we done with spikes? Maybe not. Um, spikes are going to be the result of new variants coming up, spikes in uh, break outbreaks, um, you know, what we're coming off of now. The reason I posted that I was comfortable going on the boat, so I was watching the trajectory of the strains coming up and going down, and we're going to see some awesome data right here. Waste, that's wastewater monitoring, yeah, which is incredibly powerful. Um, so, you know, and I, and, and I was worried that it was going to spike up and then go down like this with a long tail, and then I would not have gone on the trip. But it was doing this, and it was down about here, when I posted said I'm still going, because that curve, if it continued, would be beneficial. And it's what's happened. So we're fortunate. Some countries have had these long tails. Um, new strains, new troubles, right? So I told you it's BA2 now. Fortunately, it's not worse in terms of um, hospitalization or death. It's uh, the vaccines also protect it partially as well, so that there's no um, so anyway, so if you had a recent, if you had an Omicron infection, or if you had a booster, you're in pretty good shape with either Omicron virus. Um, you may get sick, and some of you probably came down with COVID in the, during the spike window, um, especially those who have kids in school. And anecdotal discussions with groups across the country, that seems to be a, a common denominator. It's not always kids, but kids seem to be a good you know, vector because they're at school. And most aren't vaccinated yet, and uh, it's just the way it is, right? And so, hopefully, nobody really got overly sick. Okay. The other thing is that is extremely encouraging, just like the vaccines a year ago, is that track treatment. So, Merck and Pfizer have dr approved drugs. I think EUA would stand for emergency use authorization to treat uh, COVID-19. Um, the, the Merck one doesn't work nearly as well as this drug, so that's going to be the first line drug. And then Biden talked about the State of the Union, I was glad to hear him say it, because we've been discussing this for a while, is the reason to have testing is so you can do something about it. I mean, it's important epidemiologically to figure out how virus is spreading, but um, most importantly, it's okay, you're positive, here's your script for this antiviral. It's a lot of pills every day. I forget how long to take it, five days or something like that. But you got to catch it early, and it works really, really well. I don't, I'm not aware of hospitalizations as a result of that. Um, and then the other thing we have to remember is just because we get everything under control in the rich countries, most of the world is not getting access to vaccine or just starting to get access. And even then, there's the logistics of bringing vaccines out to the public and getting them to agree to it. You know, there's these long history, especially in places like Africa, where... Well, okay, let's talk like this. Sorry. There's, there's, yes, there's this long history of um, Caucasians coming down and telling Africans what they should do. Um, and so there's pushback. There's same thing with the polio vaccine. Polio should have been eradicated 20 years ago, but there's um, parts of Pakistan and parts of Africa where there's this complete distrust of Western medicine. And so that's why we still have polio outbreaks in those places. So anyway, this is the thing we have to keep in mind. This could be the source of new variants because um, the virus replicates at higher levels if you're not vaccinated and it hangs around longer and mutations have to occur during replication. So if it makes one error every thousand replications, then 10,000 is going to produce quite a few errors. And if you can limit that with vaccination or treatment, uh, the chances of new variants arising drops precipitously. That was it there.
Um, so, why don't you go, Seth, and show what you've been doing. This is awesome. There's this, um, groups came up to look at virus and wastewater and um, sewage plants. And the idea was that uh, some of the virus is shed in through the GI tract. It's not a huge amount, uh, but it's there and, and you can detect it in sewage. And so that's been a great indicator of what's going on and what's going to happen. So with that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Don't want any tripping. I'll that would be bad. Yeah. So, hello. Hi. Hi. I'm just going to leave this mic right up against my chin. There you go. Excellent. He's, he's schooling me. <laughs> so, my name is Seth Malik, and full disclosure, I am an engineer. I do structural engineering. I'm a project manager for the Metropolitan Council that does wastewater treatment for the entire seven county metro area in oh, Minnesota. Minneapolis, St. Paul. Okay, that Yes. <laughs> Sorry. There I'm so used to areas. <laughs> But only one that matters. Right yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, only one that has hot dish. <laughs> with the tater tots, which is the only way to go. So, I work very closely with our uh, R&D department and our analytical laboratories. And I am currently working on a project to give them a new uh, R&D lab, and one of the things that our R&D group did was, at the start of this pandemic, they keep their eye out on the literature of what is new, what is out com coming out, and they discovered that there is a possibility to trace what remnants are left in the wastewater stream, and they said, what the heck? Let's give it a shot. They partnered with the University of Minnesota, which has an extremely good uh, biogenetics uh, laboratory. And they started discovering, OK, how do I isolate the uh, DNA, RNA samples out of the wastewater? What's the process to do this? And go through that process. And what comes out at the end is an extremely good piece of data where you've got the gray line is what the Minnesota Department of Health is doing with their, uh, with their sample and their reporting. And then the blue line is what we are getting out of our wastewater treatment. And so one of the things that you can see is it starts to lead that information. Thank you. What's the x axis? It's mm -hmm. dates across the x, and y is viral load in wastewater or copies per person per day. And so, uh, part of the uh, big issue is we needed to make sure that we calibrate what kind of data that we were getting off of here in comparison to the data there. And that's a little bit of a gray area right now. And so uh, we are working through what are the actual protocols for the next time. But what we are starting to see is there is a positive outcome of what we are seeing here as a good health initiative for large areas. And one of the cool things is, if you could go to the next slide. <laughs> so on the next slide, we've got uh, a graph depicting the different variants of the virus as they've been coming through. And obviously, we started right about here. And then as... So, November 2020, yeah. yeah, the original we don't have good data on because we're still developing all that stuff. But we start picking it up in the alpha, beta, gamma. And then we start to see that it's a little bit of a rise in the alpha, beta, gamma. But then delta really hits and it ramps up. And one of the interesting things is as delta starts to crash down, 
uh, Omicron BA1 really surges up. And you can kind of see that a little bit between Alpha, Beta, Gamma and uh, Delta. But one of the interesting things that we are starting to see is that Omicron 2, BA2, we are starting to see a little bit of that in the bottom of this line, uh, detecting it, but it doesn't seem to be coming up. So that's the red at the very bottom of the graph. I think and, there's some circulating. Right now. And if you go to the next slide, sir. <laughs> Boop, technology. Wow. <laughs> So this is uh, just in percentage of what is out there. So uh, total percentage of what uh, uh, Omicron original is, and down at the bottom we've got Omicron BA2. So basically you add those two up and it would be 100%. And there's a little bit of Delta hanging around. There's probably a little bit of Alpha Beta because there's always some that struggle around. But uh, it's very interesting the amount of data that you can get out of a wastewater treatment system, especially when it's servicing a large area. Um, for small areas, there would be a whole lot of spikes as far as variations of there was a football game, there wasn't. But when you're talking about millions of population, the data comes out pretty stable. Um, so, yeah, that's what we're doing. Uh, they use a qPCR process. Uh, our wastewater treatment people isolate that uh, genetic sample and they cool it down to cryonic levels like negative 80 degrees C. Centigrade, yes. Yeah. And Freaking cold. It's, it's extremely cold. And the nice thing is once you've got that genetic data uh, isolated and cooled to that level, so long as you keep it at that level, it's pretty much indefinite. So 20 years from now, we could still be sampling that same data to compare it against whatever else may come. But um, then we're working with the Genomic Center at the U of M to process that right now because some of the stuff that you need to do that is hella expensive. <laughs> um, just to copy that uh, DNA, RNA up to levels that's detectable is extremely specialized and extremely expensive pieces of equipment, uh, but we are working to make that a more a generalized. Question. Are those samples stored such that they can develop tests in the future for things that they might not know about now so that they can get them? There's not just for, you know. So, so what the testing does, it starts to replicate DNA from that sample. And they're, the way that they replicate it, it's not a complete sample of that DNA. It's just starting at a specific genome and copying it forward and that copying process, while it's great for magnifying it, it's not necessarily great for keeping it as a whole sample of that DNA. It's also good to know that, you know, you're not like reading up a massive amount of uh, an extremely bad thing. It's, it's fragments of the DNA. Can you speak to the, for every data point on that line, how much wastewater was condensed into a sample? So, I, I, I like the, once you learn how to do that, like, you can bank time points like backing up the sewage for posterity to look at the other <laughs> They yep. don't like you to say the word back and up. No. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm not sure what, okay. Let's, let's so, how, much, how much gallons of gray water went into so this is coming out of our largest wastewater treatment plant. We've got nine wastewater treatment plants around the area. But by, by and large, the largest one is the Metropolitan Plant, just downstream on the Mississippi River of St. Paul. And they handle something on the order of daily 
160 to 180 megagallons of water a day. So it's a massive amount of water. So how much water do you sample? The actual sample size is they take uh, samples uh, compositely throughout the day. And the actual sample that gets down to the RNA level is a little tiny ampule, like about... So, but you've seen pull a gallon total or 100 milliliters or... So, you know, you gather from these different places, you dump it together. What's the volume before you do yeah, it? That's like, yes, that's yes. Like, yes. Less than a liter. Okay. So, so like in the, in the Craig Venter's bio-environmental genomics, he just dragged a filter through the behind his boat and just... That guy's brilliant. So he uses research money to buy a yacht and sail around the world and sample. I want to be Craig. It's a great way to do it, but you're not filtering the sewage necessarily through your filter. You're just going to be filtering the one liter. That's the answer to my question. Yes. So we do take the samples as the raw sewage is coming into the plant before we do our processing section of it. There's a whole pre-filtration just to make sure that there isn't, you know, tires or something that happen to get into the wastewater treatment plant. Um, so that's where it comes out of our system at. But I do think that in the future, uh, there should, really should be a protocol that is mandated by some specific group because one of the things with data is you have to have a very specific protocol so that all of the data can mesh together and be analyzed appropriately. We've got a whole lot of wastewater treatment plants implementing these kind of processes, but it's hard to compare the data at a scientific level. You want a baseline too, right? That's the problem we have because we need it before the problem starts. Oh yes. And one of the things that you can do is you can start to look at, we know that there's certain things out there that are just endemic, uh, influenza A, that kind of stuff. Uh, obviously, we now know COVID fairly well. We do need to have very specific pieces of uh, chemicals in order to replicate DNA. And when we come across something that's novel, we have to reinvent that. But I think we're through that process now that we have a track record of how we get there. So with replication comes efficiency. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was awesome. That was the kind of stuff I was planning to show you. Not his day, his day is even better. Uh, but a number of metropolitan areas are doing this with sewage. Um, one of the challenges that he alluded to is everybody's doing it a little differently. Uh, as we're sort of making this up as we go along. Oh, closer, sorry. Yes, perfect. Great. We're making this up as we go along. Um, and so there's things called primers that are used to take those, find those regions of the genome that you're going to amplify up to calculate how many copies there are. Um, your primers may be different from mine, may be different from Charlotte, may be different from San Francisco. Um, and then how the samples are processed and how many times they amplify is um, sort of just turned, worked out empirically. You know, all right, this is what worked for us and we're gonna keep doing this. Um, so now that, especially if Omicron stays under control, we can then reorganize, re-agree on what the rules will be and what the sequences will be for the primers. We can go back to those frozen samples and then have a standard across the country comparison um, versus relative changes within a municipality. But what we, I can say is oh, all the wastewater data I've seen, which isn't a huge amount, maybe half a dozen cities, looks very similar to what's going on in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And, you know, and the big thing that was hyped on in Boston was um, that that sort of, the peaks preceded the case pre um, so, so when these things started skyrocketing in November in the wastewater in Boston, they were like, 
put your seatbelt on, it's going to be an interesting run. And then a couple of weeks later, it starts showing up in huge numbers in people. And then the same thing happened with the crash. Two weeks prior to the crash in Boston, those numbers shot way down to barely detectable. And then Boston followed behind them. So, so Worcester likes to be a bit contrarian where I work. And so we're about two, three weeks behind Boston. So Boston's green area, we're in yellow area, orange area, when you look at the CDC map, at least when I left, and maybe in the green now. Um, but just we, you know, we sequence, no sequence, we, we test everybody at the medical school every week. So we have a little microcosm of things going up and going down. And they did spike up, and I was actually pretty upset. Like, wait, it's med students. What the hell? <laughs> but it's first year med students that were, had the outbreaks. And, so, and they haven't had my class yet. That's coming in April. <laughs> Where I'll politely say, hey, don't do that again. Yes? Uh, so if you're only looking at a, a small section of the genome, isn't there a risk that you test some new variants? Right. And so most samples, not the wastewater sample, because it's hard to do. But uh, most samples get sequenced, now, which is the UK was on the forefront of this because they had facilities in place for doing other studies. Uh, so my lab sequence is 400 cases a week. Um, and so we have an algorithm all that takes those reads and maps them against, you know, builds it uh, for, for the nerds. Um, you, it's short reads, you then compile them and you build a consensus sequence. And then that consensus sequence is tested against all the known variants. And so that's how we know that almost everything in Worcester is Omicron. Occasionally we see an alpha or beta and occasionally a delta, but it's like 98, 99% Omicron. Was it like that at the beginning of December? Delta was the dominant. In a matter of two weeks, it just took over. Um, so we sequence and get the, higher, the entire genome, but it's based on pieces again. So this is where the frozen samples could be useful because we see an unusual form across the genome, not just the spike protein, but across the genome, you know, maybe we can pull that virus out, or we can reconstruct it nowadays. It would probably be cheaper to reconstruct it synthetically to study that virus and see what the properties are that make it different, um, if, especially if it's an individual, which is where new pandemics variants are coming from. It's usually from an individual or a couple individuals that came up with something not no fault of their own that is nastier or spreads better. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's scary. You can synthesize viruses. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. First one they did was polio. Lovely. Um, it was the CDC did it in uh, Atlanta, uh, and the reason they did that there was a big discussion of we shouldn't be doing these things, uh, but the other thing is well, other countries are doing it. And so we should at least be able to have the capacity to understand what's going on by studying these. Um, the second one that was synthesized was the 1918 Spanish flu. And it came from, I think it was soldiers that froze to death in the tundra in Alaska, I believe is what they, where they got it from. Um, and whose diagnosis by the doctor there suggested it was influenza. Um, so we have that virus screen lab, but it's only, you're only allowed to work with that one place, and that's at the CDC in Atlanta. So there's these different biosafety levels of containment. I'm in a BSL-3, biosafety level 3, to work on COVID. The next level is biosafety level 4, and then there's different shades of that. And the CDC has the most high-powered version of that level of security to, to study these viruses to, so they don't leak out. Wuhan Institute of Virology has a BSL-3 and BSL-4 um, operation as well. And that's why people were, were saying, well, did it escape from the lab intentionally, unintentionally? Some got on somebody and they walked out with it. Um, the latest modeling suggests no, uh, but it, you know, it's not definitive and it, it never will be. But uh, using some pretty cool forensic and molecular for net forensic approaches, overlaid on GIS data in regional locations this goes back to the market, the Wuhan market, uh, which is where SARS-CoV-1 came out of as well. Um, Tim, yeah. Three words if you want to talk about it. Gain of function. Gain of function. Oh. oh. Yeah. Um, so we do gain of function research and it's, you know, it's, it's a touchy subject. 
for obvious reasons. So if you generally make a virus more infectious or more pathogenic, you do that because you want to understand how it's doing that so you can stop that from happening. So you, know, you always need the, the man out doing damage to, co to compare to what normally happens. So you need the exception to understand the rules. And you also want to use the exception, like a gain-of-function virus that's, say, resistant to a drug, an antiviral, to understand how that resistance works and how we can modify the drug so that won't happen again. So that, that's gain-of-function. Now, you do gain-of-function studies with pretty much all viruses. So now there's these drugs available, um, and then you're going to, I don't we may end up doing this too, you end up testing to see if you can get a resistant version of COVID. And, and once you do, then you say, okay, well, what's different here? What, what's the mechanism? What's the biology and biochemistry behind that? Um, and, and there's really no other way to do those sorts of things. Uh, we've done this stuff with flu, we're also Tamavir, Tamiflu. Um, and it's so easy to get resistance in that. Um, but we found 10 different ways for resistance to appear. Uh, so they're really important studies. There's also huge amounts of security to do those things. So I put in a proposal, the school biosafety committee said, oh, wait a minute. And so we put together a standard operating procedure, how we're gonna do this, what kind of precautions are we taking, how you decontaminate it. And then they still wanted the NIH to review it. So then they sent it to the NIH and the NIH reviewed it. And they said, well, you know, there's a resistance to Tamiflu all the time, so we don't care, go ahead and do it. But if it were something like this Pfizer drug with COVID-19 where there may not be common, there isn't common resistance yet. Then it becomes an issue of, if you do the experiment, making sure that that information doesn't leave the laboratory in the context of a virus. Uh, so, yeah, thanks, you know. Um, that's a really important issue. You'll, you'll see discussions about that in newspapers and journalists um, writing about it. Um, oh, what's the guy's name in Kentucky, the senator? Um, yeah, Paul, you know, so he's been... That guy. <laughs> yeah. There's a whole like, lot like, that guy in yeah. The yeah, like your button says, yeah. Texas. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Uh, so Paul has been hitting Fauci about the studies they were doing were getting a function studies. And that was just trying to get in the mid to that when there's a gray area and he's not... Do, the, the studies that he, they were referencing were not gain of function, but there's a gray area on how you define gain of function. Um, and Big Tony F did a good job, I think, defending the studies and saying that they weren't gain of functions. But um, you know, it, if, if the Senate says no, that's considered gain of function, and they vote on it, that that's gain of function. <laughs> it can be arbitrarily defined. Um, but whenever you work with any virus in a laboratory, it changes because it's not in its natural host and it'll adapt to the cell culture system in your laboratory. Um, and sometimes that's good. It, it usually makes the virus less infectious or less disease causing. Sometimes it's bad because what you're studying does not reflect the real world. Um, and prior to this genome sequencing stuff like Bentner has developed and others, uh, we hadn't realized that that was that there was so much difference between laboratory virus and you know the virus in people. This was a big problem in the virus I worked on, CMV, because it's, it's huge. It's just, the genome's the size of a bacteria. And when they started sequencing patient samples, it's like 10% you know, of the genome's missing in the, the laboratory strain. Hey, that might be important. And it was, and it is. Uh, so yeah, these, these are real tough areas to, to work within. And you know, it's just a matter of fail safes and being careful and reporting. Uh, we're doing COVID work. We're about, we're going to get audited sometime this year, um, financially as well as biosafety and everything else we do. We have influenza uh, from birds. It's another nasty virus. I had to get security clearance to even own it, not touch it, but just have it in the freezer into Biosafety 3. And we're getting inspected in May, I think. Um, so th there is real serious effort from everybody to keep things as safe as possible. But there's no such thing as absolute security. Yeah. Um, with COVID, because, because of, as you mentioned, the, 
the lag in vaccination in other countries, which could continue indefinitely because of things that have been done to certain peoples around the world. Are we expecting to, or should we just expect to, perhaps transition to an environment where, if possible, of course, because socio-political things, um, just wearing masks whenever we've got the sniffles like they do in some other countries, or, or how can we, um, as, as a culture or as individuals, move forward against a virus that we know has the potential at any moment to mutate and then as we've seen with COVID it'll be here before we even know it exists and so by the time we hear about it it's already spreading right right, right? yeah so th so that's cultural and political yeah um and um and I, actually so the two biggest surprises of this outbreak of COVID was one how quickly vaccines came about yeah it didn't surprise me it was going to mutate like that because i study a dna virus that's supposed to be more stable than it and it mutates as well um so that surprised a lot of people but at least not me um and then the other thing that was a big surprise was you know that the political component of yeah. masking and vaccinating and you know i knew there's you'll see in the slide on thursday if you come uh, I knew that anti-vax sentiment would be real, but not on the scale. This is the first big anti-vax push with Facebook and Twitter and other social networks. Um, and, and it's having a huge impact. Um, so I don't know how you change that. It's really, I just, I think people softened up on the anti-vax movement in large numbers with Omicron. So. Luckily, they had the impetus to do something because they now saw people adjacent to them getting sick yeah. or they getting sick and realized that it's not a hoax and this could be scary. Um, you know, it's a horrible way to die, to drown in your own body fluid, but that's essentially what happens in the ICU. And anybody who's had it knows about the shortness of breath, and that can last for a long time. And so it feels like you're suffocating because you should have this shortness of breath. Um, so, I, I, you know... I don't know what's going to fix that. You know, some countries um, that wasn't an issue, Netherlands it wasn't an issue, they still had a big Omicron outbreak, but they didn't have hospitalizations and deaths at the rate we're having because they have very few unvaccinated people. So those of us who care about public health are just going to be wearing masks indefinitely, I mean, until something changes socio-politically. Yeah, you know, I was not keen on... This is opinion again on ending the vax, the mask mandates as this soon, this soon, maybe in two weeks, you know, because that curve that's coming down isn't. It's starting to do this, okay, and that this is what it was like between the big peaks, where thousands of infections, tens of thousands every week across the country, um, and thousands of deaths happening every day. Um, and so that is not lower than it, it's not lower than it's ever been. It's back to that basal state, and and that we need to see if it's going to stay at that basal state. It may go down lower, um, but I was hoping to see more data points past the peak to just make a call. So I was thrilled that Joko said, "No, you're wearing a mask. I don't care what Hal said." Uh, that was to me very reassuring. I don't like it. I, I, having a hard time recognizing eyes right. <laughs> and there's so many people I want to say hi to again and so many new people I want to meet and I'm really struggling so it you know it's there's a negative part to that right. you know yeah uh, so following on to that it seems like with all the anti-vaxxers the uh, viral antiviral treatments are really the only way forward but what mm -hmm. what belief do we have that those same people won't be resistant to those um, well, I have a tube of ivermectin upstairs. I, I take this up. It's, it's a 1% gel. It's for rosacea, but, you know, it's, and, you know, cheers. Uh, I, you're right. I, you know, I'm hoping that there will be a lower threshold to a Pfizer pill because, you know, half the men my age take Pfizer pills anyway. <laughs> um, and that was developed for something completely different. And it just started helping with, you know, erections. And like, hey, how about that? Because once you're actually sick, you're willing to treat it versus 
for right. getting sick. Um, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. So the hope is is that the resistance to a pill will be less so because it doesn't sound spooky. It's a pill. And if you take it, it's a lot of pills at first, but if you take it, you won't get sick. Because a lot of the anti-vaxxers, we're doing the antibody treatments, which is a much more onerous thing. you got to sit there for a couple hours with an IV in your arm to get the antibodies. Um, it's not terrible, but a lot of easier just to take a pill. Are the antibodies synthetic or harvested from previous patients? Yeah, so that's a yes and no answer. Um, so the way we create antibodies now for patients is it uses genetic engineering, but first we have to find the antibody that works. And so that usually comes from screening patient samples and testing and saying, oh, this one is, produces great neutralization. And it comes from something called a B cell. That's what makes antibodies. Then you clone out that gene that produces that um, protein that it, it is neutralizing. And then you engineer it so it's slightly different, more stable, and it's be made in mass quantities, either in human cells or yeast, because yeast is a great place to generate complex proteins and cheaper than human cells. And then they go through good manufacturing practices of cleaning it up and make sure it's only the antibody or antibodies. Uh, so it's a, yeah, it's a lot of work. It's part of the reason it's more expensive than the pill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Say that one more time, make sure I answer so it correctly. is there an inverse correlation between how deadly a virus is and how quickly it spreads? So, those can be independent of each other. Um, usually not, but in this case, yeah. Um, viral loads, which is how much virus is in you, um, or in a tissue, or in your lungs, or whatever, is a strong indicator of your likelihood of being hospitalized and your likelihood of dying. Um, but it's not always that strong a correlation. And some of that might be some of the host's immune response. So this is a virus is a cousin of common cold viruses. There's a lot of things that cause common colds, but there's four coronaviruses that do. And so one thought is some people who maybe recently had a cold and cleared up and made antibodies against that cold virus may cross-react a little bit, or just enough with um, the proper name of the virus, the SARS-CoV-2, um, with that virus so that um, it limits the severity of disease, even though they may have huge viral loads. And that's part of what the, it, the vaccines are sh striving for. You know, they, they aren't sterilizing, they're never designed, which means once you get vaccinated, you never get exposed or sick again from that bug. Um, that's a really high bar, and the bar of presenting disease is much more attainable, and, and that's been demonstrated. Does that answer your question? Okay. Actually, Tim, related, that was one thing I was wondering, which is when we thought about virus mutations, would the fact that, like, you know, for example, Omicron spread, spread so fast and, you know, beat out Delta, um, mean that, you know, the virus self-selects for something that is less, you know, pathogenic, less deadly to the host, because it can be around longer and affect more people and thus replicate, which is all it cares about. Or is that not necessarily directly correlated? Yeah, so there's two answers to that. Um, I'll do the first one, which is viruses, host dynamic, usually evolve to a draw. Okay, and the draw could mean like a cold virus. You get a cold, it's not likely to kill you. It's not likely to send you to the hospital. It might make you feel crappy and sneezy for two, maybe three days. Um, well, that's a coronavirus. So it, there's very possible that that was a nasty virus initially and then it became less and less pathogenic. And so I'm of that camp that given enough time, COVID-19 you know, COVID will evolve to that point. Others are not. We may have more surprises along the way uh, so, so the way these things happen, so the first part of your question, is population genetics, which is an area I like to play in as well. And so there isn't one virus in anybody. There is a most common virus based on the genetic sequence, and then there's that lower frequency, lots of other variants that can replicate, and they can go from host to host. They're just not better at replicating than the dominant one. 
And if something changes, like you're vaccinated against the dominant one, or you had an infection against the dominant one, these other ones that can get around whatever response the host has can now become the new dominant one. Okay. And so where these variants come from is when they replicate. So if you replicate 100 times and you make 10 mutations on 10 different genes, genomes out of the 100, they're already minority. And, it, and so that happens all the time and eventually they can replace if given the right circumstances. Um, it, there should be a mathematical endpoint where everything's been sampled in terms of different variants, but no, and there won't, we don't see any future ones coming up that could be dangerous. Um, if this had been a virus like measles, which has been studied ad nauseum, uh, for good reason, then we'd be a little more, not better at predicting there's not going to be new variants that are going to be problematic. So this virus keeps surprising us. Um, in theory, and in my hopes, that's the direction it'll go in, is it just weaken itself. And our immune system will learn to manage it better by being educated by prior infections and vaccines, or taking a drug right away. So your immune system is still responding, even though the virus is slowing down its replication. So it's, those are like little booster shots, if you will. With the uh, relationships, have we seen any data showing any difference between the way people who were infected with old school SARS 10 to 15 years ago have responded to COVID exposure or people who have been infected with other coronaviruses have responded to SARS-CoV-2? That's a great question. Um, so I don't remember how many people got SARS-CoV-1, which was that sauce you're referring to, um, but 8,000 people died. So it must have been 20,000, 16,000, because it had a 50% mortality rate. So there's not a lot of people that got infected and recovered, although they are mostly in China and Toronto, there's a large Chinese community there, and that's where one of the big outbreaks happened. Um, so I don't know, you know, and it would probably be just be anecdotal reports because there's not enough patient base. There could be, um, you could do this with cold viruses, and that's what people are trying to do now, is um, using multivariate analysis and looking at all different variables and see which ones inform the infection, you know, the, the projection of how viruses are going to be, is it going to get milder, or that you have better protection from these different infections. Because it could, it may not even have anything to do with a cold virus, it may be another part of infection, there's some cross-reaction. So there's a lot of fun math. There's been some discussion about careers in bioinformatics and stuff. That's that's a hot field right now. Yeah. So uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk But it's, you know, it's naval gazing. And I was like, okay, this, this, and this is happening in the southern hemisphere. So we anticipate those will show up in the northern hemisphere. But the, so the decision is made nine months in advance because you have to make three billion doses of vaccine. And that takes right. a lot of time. Um, and so the virus will have changed in that time window so that when it shows up in the winter in the northern hemisphere, the vaccines don't work as well as we want. I mean, the target's 60, I don't know if you remember, you know, Tony Fauci was saying, you know, the goal was 60, 65% protection. So the one-shot adenovirus from J&J &J was, if that was the, if we didn't have the RNA vaccines, that was the standard, and they hit it. Um, and, and it just got overrun by this ridiculously incredible protection with the uh, RNA vaccines. So, um, but yeah, I, I do think that this could become seasonal, you know, although it's not following seasonal with the peaks it now. It's about a two month cycle right now. Right, right. Um, and hopefully, but we've never had a population 
that's majority exposed either by vaccine or infection. And in the U.S., we're in that space now, 70, 80 percent. Um, and so it may stabilize into something more seasonal. Um, you know, you can have flu outbreaks in the summer. It's just more likely to happen in the winter. Um, and it's, I think it's going to, the word is attenuation, becoming less uh, infectious in terms of disease. Uh, yeah, that's, I, I think that's where it's going to end up. I hope that's where it's going to end up. And I think the drugs will help that. So, uh, Tim, I, I recall that uh, the Spanish flu was associated much later with Parkinson's disease. And somebody, maybe you, figured out that CMB is associated with multiple sclerosis. What's this going to cause? Hmm. It's going to cause nerve damage. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it is causing nerve damage. Yeah. Right. So, so the correlation with, I think, is it, it's MS. So this multivariate monstrosity study looking at all possible things that correlate with MS. And the virus that came up was Epstein-Barr virus. There's always been different herpes, it's a herpes virus, there's always been a number of herpes viruses that were thought to be candidates, CMVs, one of them. HHV6 is the one that had the strongest correlative data. Uh, this data says it's a cousin, EBV. So Epstein-Barr virus is what causes mono. So many of you have are very familiar with that. Uh, you're supposed to get it as an infant. So here's, you know, the cultural differences between develop and developing world is the developing world, infections happen the way they've been happening for millions of years. And at least for the herpes virus, they've been around for millions of years. Um, you're supposed to get them when you're young and they help educate your immune system. So it's a trade-off. The virus gets in, it gets to spread, and it educates your immune system so that uh, you're protected against other things. If you don't get this virus as a kid, which doesn't happen outside of rich northern white and Asian countries, um, you get mono as a teenager. And what mono is, is just your immune system overreacting to the virus. Because it's in an immune cell, it's in a B cell. And so the body's like, holy shit, we can't have this, this is terrible. And so they, like COVID, they throw everything at it and that's what makes you feel awful for three months or more. Um, so that's, it looks like it's going to be EBV. So you, they're on this one. For Parkinson's, it's, I don't know if there's anything yet. And for Alzheimer's, CMV has been associated in small studies. Um, it wouldn't be, you know, diabetes has been associated with some viral infections as well. So what happens during these infections is your immune system is struggling to respond. And, and antibodies are made semi-randomly in terms of what they target. And the ones that do hit the target then get a signal to grow and divide and make lots and lots of antibodies. Um, the other ones then usually just go away. But some of those attack our, 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 our own organs and tissues and cause an autoimmune response. Um, and that's probably part of what's probably happening with MS is you get an EBV flare up and it's usually asymptomatic and then it overstimulates the immune system and it's attacking the nervous system. So the, for COVID-19, the virus is damaging peripheral nerves. I mean, it can do worse work than they get into the central nervous system, but it is damaging peripheral nerves. And that leading to lethargy, along with things called cytokines, which also make you feel lethargic, and is causing um, neuropathy. So you can have numbness in your fingers or tingling um, and have pain associated with that or other areas where sensory nerves are. Um, that's what long COVID is starting to look like. There's other things, but that seems to be the theme. So the main controller of that process and the GI tract is the vagus nerve. Um, and so there's been some associations with the vagus nerve being damaged during infections. Um, is it, you know, healable? I don't know, but um, you're, you're right on though. That's the pattern. Is that there's going, there's looks like even for people who have mild infections, I think the number is 30% have long-term consequences, long-term being more than a week. So it could be three weeks, it could be a year. Um, and as we understand this better, it'll get modified with the definition. Now, what do you do about that? You know, if it's the immune system, then it's dealing with the, the immune response. It's like you would any other you know, um, autoimmunity. Of people having a COVID 
an infection, recovering in a week or two, but then months down the line, suddenly developing symptoms of long COVID, you know, kind of like we saw with Barry Yes, Bella. yes, that happens, right. So this idea that um, the long-term neuro effects can be delayed and not come up early. And then, why? You know, I don't know. It, it, it could be that the feedback mechanism, the immune system, is not optimal, and so um, you're still creating new antibodies to test, and then when they hit something they recognize, and if it happens to be a protein expressed on a neuron, um, then the neuron gets attacked. Uh, or the cells called Schwann cells, which surround neurons, they're, they're like the insulators around neurons that may manage the electric current. Uh, a lot of, I think there's damage in those cells and something else called astrocytes in, in uh, COVID-19. Of what? Uh, all of us eating in the dining room together and masked. How do you feel about that? Um, I've been to two restaurants in the last two years. Uh, so I've been doubly cautious. And then through the holidays, we went to complete shutdown. You know, just groceries only. And, um, and I have to go work a couple days a week. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I don't know. I'm not, I'm, I think this is the safest possible public gathering from the sense I got from the 2020 cruise and how everybody drank the Kool-Aid and washed their hands and, you know, limited space and when you could. So taking your mask off to eat um, in this context is probably far safer than even, you know, family for the holidays with people coming in from all over, even though people here are coming in from all over, right? You know, we get it. Um, these things might work. And so I'm not too uncomfortable with it. Um, I'm kind of enjoying it because I haven't done it before. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's always risk. If one person has it, then it'll spread. Um, the layers of security to get on the boat, I'm impressed by. And the fact that we play by the rules. Anybody else? We got 20 more minutes or so. Is there some amount of mutation where they will stop calling it COVID-19 variant Zeta and start calling it COVID-22? Yeah, so the, the BA2, there's an ongoing discussion on whether that should be called a new variant or not. Um, there's no hard and fast rules defining this. It's more of a consensus of these variants and the biology are different enough to justify giving it another name. So Delta was way more... Uh, infectious and way more pathogenic than alpha, beta, and gamma, which gamma you've never heard anything about. Um, and so that's why it got its own Greek but, letter. Are, are they ever going to just say this one is COVID-22? It's so different, it's not even COVID-19 oh, so the, so the, No, the 19, oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. So the 19 refers to the year was detect, mm. detected. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, but so. if they d discover a variant that is so different oh, next year, year. Yeah. 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 It, it'll get a Greek letter. It'll still so okay. so the whole disease is called COVID nineteen okay. coronavirus um, infectious disease nineteen because mm -hmm. that's the year. And a lot of our naming try to close who the year when it's first discovered. But they're not just gonna, they're not going to update the year if they find a really different one. They're just going to keep. See they're not going to update the year then, even if they find a really no, good no, no. Okay. When it, you know, when the next coronavirus crosses over, okay. then they'll um, they'll get a new name, most likely. Um, so the year designation indicates it crossing over, not necessarily when that particular one was found. Right. So the index case, the first real confident this is COVID, that got the year, which was in. Originally it was December, but now they've tr traced it back to November cases in the Wuhan area. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Hypothetically, if you were to take a small group of fully vaccinated individuals and isolate them from the rest of the world, how long before they could start acting normal? <laughs> like, if we didn't make port and just stayed out at sea ah, for a while. See, that was my plan on 2020. I thought we would just stay on Half Moon Key. Get off the boat, go for a swim, get on the boat, have food brought to us. And, uh, yeah, that, I would have been okay with this group of people. I would have been really okay with that. 
and I'd be okay with this time. So there are studies being done by volunteers. Uh, it's a laboratory at Oxford. They study influenza, and they get volunteers, and they give them the flu, and, and then they study, the, they'll try some interventions, and then look at their immune haplotype and try to correlate that to severity of disease. Um, they've done it with dengue, which is a really nasty virus spread by insects uh, through the tropical regions, where we are basically now. <laughs> um, you know, like a half a million people get that each year. Uh, so I think they're doing COVID studies. And when they say volunteers, of course they mean graduate students. In the, you know, <laughs> Uh, here's a stipend, right? You know, if you're going to be locked up for a week or two, they give you a couple grand, and you're bored for the length of time. Or if you wear a uniform. What's that? Or if you wear a uniform. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I'm curious about uh, I'm trying to think how to phrase it. Uh, so the illnesses. Um, I'm going to answer it and let me know if I answered your question. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. there's a lot of comorbidities, would be the term, um, and they could be um, something that's totally unrelated to a virus or the pathology of a virus. It could be um, pre existing conditions um, that add up. And, and so, some are easy to identify diabetes, right? Some of them. It looks like the, you know, the, the status of a person's immune system, the status of their mental health, and why would that matter? I don't know beyond um, your immune system is greatly impacted by your mental state. Um, that's a new area of research that was poo-pooed for a long, long time. Um, and it's that Vegas nerve that's <laughs> central to all of this. Uh, so there's a lot of potential for the virus exacerbating a pre-existing condition or the pre-existing condition making the infection worse. Uh, and, and that's all being sorted out in the world. Yeah, that's a, sorry, I am a clinician. There's some other effects there as well. If, uh, if you don't get your cancer screening, you're more likely to die of cancer. And that has obviously happened to quite a few people during COVID. If the hospital's full and you show up with a heart attack, you're going to have a delay in your treatment. So those are all sort of secondary effects of the pandemic going on that clearly have had an impact. And if then there are some COVID-related things, like does it increase your risk of heart disease? Probably. We know that it increases your risk of dying uh, after a surgical operation for reasons we can't explain, and it's not one thing that you are dying of, but the death rate of people who have COVID is higher than people who don't when they have surgery. And so some of those are probably immune effects that we don't haven't untangled yet. And then there's a direct rate of COVID. But you can go look at, the CDC publishes periodically a excess deaths calculation, which is not related to cause, it's just how many people were supposed to die in 2019 and how many did in 2020 and 2021 and we're about two million deaths ahead in the last two years yeah and, and i forgot to mention heart disease that's a big confounder in all of this um the virus so there's the immune system that's attacking tissues and organs and the virus seems to be doing damage to blood vessels smaller blood vessels uh, and that would could interfere with the heart's ability to get oxygen. And then your oxygen that in your blood goes down because your lungs full of fluids. That's when I went and bought this to do the oxygen sensing. Um, and uh, you know, so it's a pile work sometimes, making things worse and worse. But yeah, heart issues. That's a lot of so many of the deaths that happened to like athletes from COVID was because they had a pre-existing sensitivity to heart issues that hadn't been recognized yet because they're young, fit, healthy. Um, 
and what this does is pull the, the covers back and reveals that there's something going on there by making it worse, unfortunately. Yeah. Has there been any updated uh, guidance or studies around what the best for indoor mitigation? You know, versus like HEPA filtration, airflow, things like that versus like barriers. So there's a recent study, um, I posted it on Facebook, it, it was, it's in an archive, it's not peer reviewed yet, and it's a small study, and the authors point this out, here's our limitations. And what they did was they put in sealed, enclosed, enclosed two rooms, and they would recruit somebody who had COVID, who was not a college, usually a college student, to go spend time in one of the rooms and, and try to figure out which variables influence potential of spread. Okay, by sampling the air and surfaces in the room the person's in and the adjacent room which I have booked in. Um, and so there, and they say, take this with a grain of salt, but what mattered most was filtration, and have the filtration, open windows, which is more of the same. Um, there was another one, but the thing that did not correlate was Distancing, three feet versus six feet versus nine feet, because the aerosol stays airborne for a long time. So that's the other thing. Humidity. So mid-range humidity, so 30 to 8, 70, 80 percent, is the ideal level of humidity to bring these particles out of flotation and settle on the surface. And it apparently makes physics sense. I mean, I can imagine the physics to make this work, but you're getting a particle and now you're hydrating it, so it's mass going up and it can settle. But if it's too humid, like fog, fog will keep it, even though once it's settled, will keep it suspended. Is that the right answer? I hope so. <laughs> you're shaking your head. It makes sense. I, I don't know the physics, but that's what I came up with. From a, from a multi-phase fluid flow standpoint, uh, which is something that I have way more familiarity with than I originally intended. Uh, yes, it, it, that does make sense, especially when you have a, a hydroscopic pad of a particle, which would be a droplet, something like that. There's going to be, um, for lack of a better word, a tendency to cohere with other water molecules that are suspended in the, in the air and the quicker, if, if it's at a very high humidity, that happens more rapidly if the, the particle gains mass and settles out of, of the flow. Think clouds, precipitation, that sort of thing, fog, that sort of thing. If it's very, very dry, the moist, the, the moist viral particle, viral droplet, aerosol droplet, will actually give up its moisture into the air, uh, the broader air. The particle dries out, and the virus basically will die, whatever it's decaying mm -hmm. is. I, I'm not, that's not the case, that's not something that I've ever had to deal with. Right. Uh, but whatever the decay time is, is the, the viability of the viral particle that's contained within the, the aerosol droplet because once it's exposed and, and dried out. Mm -hmm. um, it, yes, in that middle ground, you can keep aerosolized droplets if you've got circulation. Mm -hmm. I know fairly early on there were some studies in restaurants and that sort of thing where they, and they did a lot of CFD simulation which is something that, again, I, I, I know a fair bit about. And I saw absolutely nothing unusual in any of those simulations that would cause me to think, okay, this is wrong. I, I got my chops in on CFD sims and complex geometries, both the basic flow in complex geometries in the auto industry, modeling airflow through cooling systems and under hoods, which are insanely weird geometry stuff. And so you get to where you can kind of see air uh, when, you're, when you're doing that. And the, a lot of the studies that have been done about that, about the propagation in the airborne, um, I, like I said, I have not seen anything of, and I, you know, I have my own reasons for paying attention to this. Uh, 
I haven't seen anything that, that triggers any, hey, wait a second, they did, they did this wrong mm -hmm. in no sense. So that, all, that does all make sense. So that's, that's very encouraging. And it's so cool to... The things that are so disparate in terms of fields of study and knowledge bases, um, can, or people are recognizing, hey, I can contribute something to this by providing information or studies um, that have really helped us understand this in a very short time window. The other part of that study I forgot was they said the distance didn't matter so much for tra you know virus transmission. It seemed more to be amount of time spent with a person shedding virus. So time is more important than distance. So if we're with somebody, you know, for a few minutes, have a hug, or eat dinner together, um, the length of that dinner if the person is shedding virus will impact the statistics of you breathing in enough virus to set up an infection. Yeah? So I have a question. Um, so and about shedding, uh, has there, I know there were with the other strains, there was data saying that if you're vaccinated, you're is there anything about the Omicron that says the same thing, or is it is our shed rate for Omicron still higher than Delta or other Delta? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I fully heard you. So, so no, that's not you. See, I thought it was really smart when I was a teenager and in college to play punk rock. <laughs> There's the volume. And you know, and the goal was to see if you could, these are all tubes amplifiers because they produce better sound. These see, go to eleven. Yeah, and to see how quickly we could, I could blow my amplifier. That was a badge of iron. Um, then you smashed the guitar. Um, so I'm paying for that now. <laughs> With the hearing, uh, I didn't think it made sense then. Um, so please say your question again. So, do we, are we, I read somewhere that it was, there was a correlation between a higher shed rate on the con, even though we were vaccinated, um, as opposed to the prior strain, and that was one of the factors that it spread to. So, yeah, okay, so, yeah, there seems to be a number of things that are influencing its ability to spread, and what you just described is one, virus load even if you've been vaccinated, is higher than it would have been if you got Delta or Alpha or Beta um, and, you know, asymptomatically sh shut it. Um, it's also, most of those other viruses were up in the nose. Omicron is in the throat, so oral pharyngeal infection. Um, that may influence its ability to spread. Uh, you know, when you're talking, singing, you know, you throw out a lot more moisture and therefore particles than you would through your nose unless you sneezed um, or, or cough and come up through your nose. So that's another component. It's not definitive, but that's another likely contributor to all of this. Um, and the fact that it, it can bind the ACE receptor better than the other viruses and it can invade the antibodies better than the other viruses. So you can get a high titer, and you can get as high viral load as somebody who had Delta, um, but when you average it all out, it tends to be a little bit lower. And what definitely happens is that the window where you're shedding virus is shorter with Omicron, especially when you're vaccinated. So instead of shedding virus for up to 10 days, there's always an exception to the rules here. That's the one thing about biology. Biology didn't read the books. Um, and so they always have an exception to the rule. Um, but, um, I lost my train of thought. Um, it's gone. I need a wine here. <laughs> uh, but let's follow up. I'll try to answer it better. Um, anyway. Yes? I confess I'm having a little trouble concentrating because I'm trying not to throw up. Um, but I last well, I, I have that effect on a lot of people. I, I, <laughs> I latched on to cytokines, and, and I want to ask you to clarify or uh, opine. Uh, so cytokines are part of an inflammatory cascade, and we're learning more and more that cardiac disease, diabetes, uh, mental health issues, uh, neuropathies, um, 
everything is worse with inflammation. And what I'm trying to put together as a clinician is if we can do something to improve our the inflammatory level of our diet, our stress level, or whatever, do we get to do something that counteracts what you said about cytokines? So, yes, that's the thinking. Um, so lifestyle changes that reduce your basal inflammatory state. You know, rosacea I have is an inflammatory response. And so sometimes I've been on the end of one. That's why I got little scratches and pimples and stuff. Um, so in theory, if I got exposed then, I may have had a higher risk of having a more severe infection than now we're settling down. Um, there, so many interventions are managing you know, prior to drugs for gestabars is dealing with symptoms, which is, as you know, um, too much is dependent on system, you know, uh, symptoms control and not stopping whatever's happening because that's a lower fruit to grab. You know, there are drugs that will manage cytokines. Um, but cytokines are extremely important as well. So we get infected all the time and we get cancer all the time. And it's self-limiting, and the reason it's limiting is because of the immune response. And the first responder in the immune response is the inflammatory cytokine response. And in fact, a cell that gets infected, if it's able to turn on its inflammatory response, it'll share that info with neighboring cells, and they will be prepared so that they can't be, those cells will not be able to get infected. So the one cell dies from the infection, the virus tries to spread to neighboring cells, and it, they won't, it won't take is they're already armed. But that's a dangerous state to be in all the time, or it's just chronic inflammation. So it's meant to be an acute response and then down, um, but sometimes it stays up and it keeps reacting and reacting. Uh, so again, yeah, and a lot of our health issues are managing that inflammation um, and improving things. So even things like MS, right? It's the treatments, as I understand, are mostly managing inflammation um, and just buying time for the body to get through whatever it's going through to produce a response so that you, your, your MS episode abates sooner than it would have. Yeah. Um, you stated that with Omicron, we were sort of virus. So, you know, so the, the saving grace is it's not an either or. There is still virus in the nasal parasites, and there's plenty to detect by those nasal swabs. Um, but there's other places that do saliva. And so, you know, with the other variants, it's in both compartments. It's just more so in the nasal in the earlier versions. Omicron's more so in the oropharyngeal um, upper respiratory. Um, so either can work. Um, and the assays are sensitive enough that they capture low amounts. Um, you know, the rapid diagnostic test, the antibody antigen test uh, is similar. They're, they've gotten pretty sensitive. Um, and studies, so I'm part of this program called RADx, it's NIH, which stands for Rapid Diagnosis. So all the EUA tests, the emergency use authorization tests that you took to get here, were developed through this program. And it was NIH throwing money at the problem and working with companies, the FDA, and academic institutions doing the clinical studies, which is what we were doing, are doing, um, to develop these tests so that the risk is reduced for the companies, and yet, same thing with the vaccine, but yet, you know, humanity is going to benefit. Um, the issue becomes, so you, you do the test, PCR, and you go positive, so you go do an antigen test, and it's negative. And usually if you do that every day, by day three, if not sooner, you're positive. Um, so there's a gap. And with Omicron, that gap's bigger. It's not clear why. Um, but this could be a biological explanation. It could be that the antibodies that were designed don't work as well against this new variant in terms of recognizing it. Uh, it's not a huge problem. There's some studies coming out that suggest it still recognizes it with sufficient sensitivity that um, a negative that then becomes a positive, so it's a false negative, and the next day it's a positive. 
is probably more of the biology of the virus, which as a scientist, I think is fascinating. I want to figure out what that is. Uh, yeah, anybody else? So while you're thinking about it, you know, I'm here all week. I love to talk to people. Uh, a little shy in groups, unless I'm here, because now there's space. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, I'm sitting out in public. It means I'm up for chatting with anybody, even if I'm just reading or staring at my phone, and I should be looking at the beautiful scenes outside. Um, last call. Right, thank you so much. I'm so thrilled that you all came out and get to see your faces. And did Joey leave? Well, yeah. Okay. I don't think you'd had breakfast in there. Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, I want to thank Joey for his yeah. song again. Um, that was so cool of him. Oh, you better record it so she'll get the message. Thanks, Joey. I love that. <laughs>